welcome to our webinar on transition capital um, management. Um, I'm Jenny Gibbons, R&D Manager at Verico, and I'm very pleased to welcome Alina von Kaiser and Columbia University of British Columbia in Canada. I was very fortunate to spend some time working with Nina and when I worked out there for, for two years. It's great to have her here in the UK to tell us about some of her current and most recent research. We've got quite a few of you online listening to us today. We're pretty new to this webinar um, business, so we're hoping it will run as smooth as possible. Um, but do bear with us if we do encounter any technical difficulties. So um, without further ado, I would love to hand over to Nina, um, and she will tell us um, about improving the life of the transition capital. Okay, so what I want to do now is spend some time with uh, you basically sharing with you some of the work that we've been doing in the Transition Cal. And the Transition Cal, you know, she is really the nuts and bolts for the dairy producer in terms of the fact that, you know, you, she needs to have a baby in order to produce milk. But she has a bit of a challenging life. Um, you know, she enters the far off phase um, with, in terms of going through the dry off, uh, the dry off procedure. There's usually a change of diet, and then there's often um, also accompanied by regrouping. She's some. What's quite common is then to move to the close up group about three weeks before calving, and then again there's another change in diet. Uh, she's then usually uh, moved to some sort of maternity pen or calving pen. Uh, sometimes hours before she calves, sometimes two days before she calves because we don't, uh, aren't always sure when she's going to have her baby. But then she calves and then she's separated from her calf and then she's often moved to the fresh group and again we have another change in diet. Lactation starts for the first time calvers. That's often the very, very first time that they're introduced to the parlor. And then at sometimes in, in some of the larger farms, what we'll see is the fresh group will then, in either two or three weeks postpartum, be moved again to the high group, and again, we sometimes see a change in diet. So, as a good friend of mine, Jesse Goff from Iowa State, in one of his papers wrote, the transition from the pregnant non-lactating state to the non-pregnant lactating state is too often a disastrous experience for the cow. And, you know, you wonder, I just went through these five, uh, these six, seven, eight things that she has to experience all within a very, very short time period. And so what's happened is the way I look at now, the, the dairy producer, he's got to manage all these things. And one of the challenges that he also has is that he basically has to also manage disease. The lactational incidence of, um, this is some work that was published about 10 years ago um, out of the U.S., and you can see that the types of illnesses that these cows succumb to is mastitis, cystic ovaries, metritis, retained placentas, displaced abomasum, ketosis, milk fever. You know, she has a dis difficult calving, dystocia. And one of the reasons that I've used this data slide is because in this case, they've also got lameness. And one of the take-home messages that I hope to leave you with is that I would like you to also think about lameness as a transition cow disease. But I'll try to give some evidence to convince you of that. The challenge that we have, or the reality, is that if we compare, if we lump together clinical illness and subclinical illness, about 30 to 50 percent of cows are getting sick, and that's a huge amount. So, what can we do to try and, you know, cap, look at this problem, take it apart, and hopefully do something so that we can improve um, the health state of these of these cows? We clearly disease as a huge problem for the producer as well as the cow. It's decreased milk production, decreased reproductive efficiency, decreased longevity, increased involuntary culling, obviously lost dollars. And I would hope that we also recognize that there's decreased welfare. And I know that there's a huge appreciation that lameness is a serious welfare uh, concern. I also hope that the industry starts to embrace the fact that illness during transition is also a serious welfare concern, and we need to do a better job of trying to come to grips with this. So the question that we had starting out about eight, six, eight years ago is, I mean, I said 30 to 50 percent of the cows get sick. So, but that also means, if you flip that on its head, that we have a whole bunch of cows that stay healthy. 
So why do some cows get sick and others stay healthy? So what I'm going to do over the next 35, 40 minutes is walk you through some of the research that we've done. First of all, we've done a lot of work trying to identify behaviors that are linked to disease, basically changes in behavior. And then I'm going to walk you through some of the research that we've done where we, in ter terms of determining which management practices affect those behaviors, and at least give us some insight to how we should, can possibly tweak the management of that to try and uh, minimize disease. So can behavior help us identify cows at risk for disease? And this is one of the cows in our own research facility um, with a big question mark on it. And we do, we have this in, in order for the students to identify cows from video. And most of our cows have video 24-7 on them, so nothing is private anymore. So I'm going to start out with some of the work that we've done on metritis. And it is uh, a disease that's, I mean, I think most producers recognize that, um, or they think about metritis um, in that it's frequently diagnosed in the first couple of weeks of after calving. And it has huge impact in terms of reproduction. And during the time that we started this work, we were having some challenges in our own research herd when it came to metritis. So one of the things that we are challenged with constantly is when we're doing science is to try and come up with measures that are repeatable. And I mean, no disrespect to the veterinarians that are on the webinar, but one of the things that, you know, as somebody that studies animal behavior um, was, was tremendous vari variation in the definition of metritis. So we ended up calling a good colleague of mine, uh, Stephen LeBlanc, who's uh, from the University of Guelph Population Medicine Department, who's done a lot of work in this area. And I think we actually, I mean, poor Stephen, we put him through the ringer because he gave us a definition, and we then tried to go and do inter-observer reliabilities on it, which basically is, if you've read the definition and you have a little bit of training, if two individuals then score the cows, do they come up with the same definition? And we struggled at first a little bit with that, but at the end of the day, we came up with the ones that are on the screen right now, and we had very high intra-observer reliability. And basically what we were doing is we were vaginal discharging, vag scoring the vaginal discharge on these cows. Uh, vaginal discharge of 0, 1 um, was diagnosed, cows were diagnosed as healthy. Vaginal discharge score of 2 and 3, and that was dependent upon, in large part, on how much pus was available. So less than 50% pus with a bad smell was a VD uh, score of 2. A bad smell with more than 50% pus was the VD score of 3, and these cows may or may not have a fever. The vaginal discharge score 4, and I apologize for anybody that's had their dinner already, um, was smelly, rotten, you had to basically pinch your nose closed because it was so horrible. Putrid smell, fever, and the bad of the bad. So we did this. And I had a student called Jeff Erton who came and wanted to do a master's with us. And we were early days starting out with this. We didn't have a feed intake system at that time. We did have a system that would monitor how often cows went to the feeder and how much time they had their head under the feed rail. So basically within 50 to 60 centimeters of the feed. So what Jeff did is he, he watched a whole series of uh, transition cows and he started about two weeks before calving and he followed them to three weeks after calving. The reason that there's a gap in the middle is that the cows are moved to the maternity pen and we didn't have uh, the ability to look at feeding behavior in the maternity pen so that's why there's a gap in the middle. And This is the, the feeding time minutes per day of cows that were healthy. And in Jeff's case, we only looked at healthy and, and uh, severely metritic cows. So as you can see, the cows went along, they, they were at the feed bunk, and then it declined a little bit, and then they uh, calved, and it started a little bit lower, and they went along their merry way. When Jeff did this experiment, he basically watched all the cows, and then after the experiment was finished, he assigned the cows to either the healthy treatment or the, cow, the metritis treatment, Bearing in mind that any cow that had any other disease was eliminated from the data set because we're really only interested in metritis. So if she had milk fever, we didn't count her. These are the cows 
<clears throat> that were identified having severe metritis about day 7 to 10 after calving. I don't think anybody's shocked to see that cows, when they're sick, have a fever, have um, there's infection in the reproductive tract, that they're declining in time spent feeding. All of these cows were under veterinary observations before calving, and were all any cow that was uh, was sick before calving for whatever reason was not included in the data set. So, for from the person's or the stock person's perspective and from Jeff who ran the experiment, these cows all looked healthy before calving. And what you can see is that about 10 days before calving, they're starting to show declines in feeding behavior. So we were really excited about this. Um, we published this paper and we got tremendous pushback <laughs> from the academic literature and other researchers because we didn't know anything about dry matter intake. So we set out to, Jeff went on and got a job, and I had another student that come and do a master's with me, um, a young woman called Julie Huzzy, who was super keen to work on uh, transition cows. And this is a picture of our research facility. Um, we had received a grant to buy a feed intake system that allowed us to monitor feed intake in group house cows. And this was the first of system of its type in, in North America, because prior to this, most of them had used feed intake systems where cows had to be trained to a specific gate. In this case, all cows can go to all gates. And the, they've got an RFID tag in the ear. We can monitor when she approaches the gate, at what time that she was there, how much she ate at that specific visit. So what Julie did is, she set out and basically used the ex same experimental setup that Jeff had used, except that this time she ran, I think Jeff had about, if I remember right, about 12 or 14 cows in each of those categories. Julie ran 101 cows through this experiment. Cows were enrolled in the study starting uh, 25 days before calving, and they were kept in the study until 21 days post-calving. It was dynamic, so cows entered the experiment and then went through the experiment, then left. And, other, and when some left, others entered. Again, what we also had on this experiment is we, unlike the first one where we moved the cows um, into a maternity pen that we had no ability to observe them. This time the maternity pen, we also had the same feed intake system, we had video on the cows, and what we did was we actually corrected any of the data for the time that the cow calved. After all the cows were done, Julie then assigned cows to category, and this time we also looked at the mildly metritic cows. We used the same scoring system that we had I described to you earlier, in Julie's case, she had 23 healthy cows from 101. When I show this, people are absolutely shocked. They must think that we have a horrible herd. I mean, our rolling herd average is 11,500 kilos. We have a highly productive herd. I don't, what I think in this case, what you have to remember is that these cows were vet checked every three days and treated and we what we did is we scored them from the from the day that they calved every three days for metritis and we also looked for any other um, illness. We did not exclude cows from treatment so all cows that were identified as sick were treated and these cows that are healthy are truly absolutely healthy healthy. We had 27 cows that were in the mildly metritic category and uh, 12 cows that had that horrible horrible um, vaginal discharge score of four and were diagnosed as severely metritic. Again, just to emphasize, they had no other evidence of disease. So that's why, you know, a bunch of cows don't show up in this data set because they had one, more than one ailment. Cows were assigned to treatment and then behaviors looked at retrospectively. So <clears throat> unlike the first experiment where we did feeding behavior, now we had dry matter intake. And so this is dry matter intake kilograms per day and here we have 14 days of data before calving to 21 days of data past, uh, post calving. The reason that we don't have more pre-calving is that even though they were enrolled in the experiment based on expected calving date, they don't always calve when we think they're going to calve. So from the cows that are in this data set, um, 
we had complete data for all of them when we went to 14 days before calving. So here we have the healthy cows. Uh, what you see is that they kind of, they start out at about 15 kilos of, uh, of TMR every day. And then unlike any other textbook that you normally look at in terms of animal science or dairy science or nutrition, where it's quite common to read, well, cows will, um, starting one week before calving, they'll start to decline in intake. We didn't see that with these healthy cows. They went along. The day before they calved, they dropped. I mean, I've had two kids right around the time that they were born. I wasn't always feeling so great. I, so they dropped in intake. They took a couple days, and then they went along their merry way. These are the cows that were diagnosed with mild, as mildly metritic. Clinical signs of infection were, were diagnosed between seven and eight days postpartum. And again, as I said earlier, I don't think anybody's surprised that there's a decrease in intake in the days that they were at actually clinically ill. But what was really interesting here is that we're already starting to see reductions in those in dry matter intake in the days prior to calving. Now if we drop down those cows that were severely metritic, those cows that were very, very sick, huge declines in intake postpartum, but what you can see is that they're already struggling about a week before calving. We're seeing these um, significant reductions in dry matter intake. So, and again, just to, to make, make sure that everybody's aware, all of these cows were diagnosed as healthy prepartum. So it made us think, you know, what is happening in that week before calving that, you know, makes these cows not eat? Is it because they're subordinate? And then thankfully we have this fancy feed intake system so we'll, and we're, allow, we're able to go back and look at what she did in the seven days before calving and what she, we averaged the dry matter intake for every hour. So what we have here is this is an average, as I said, of the seven days bef uh, before calving. Average dry matter intake for each hour in kilograms on the y-axis and midnight to midnight along the x-axis. We feed in our barn twice a day, usually between eight, these cows were between eight and nine in the morning and again between four and five in the afternoon. We've done lots and lots of work on just basic feed bunk management and feeding behavior, and we know that the delivery of fresh feed is a huge motivator for cows to approach the feed bunk. And so what we see here, those non-feed delivery times, and particularly sort of after 7 o'clock in the afternoon, and sort of in the shoulder times approaching feed in, uh, delivery in the morning, we didn't see any differences in feed intake. Where we saw the declines happening was in this primary time of the day when the majority of the dry matter intake is eaten, sort of between the fresh feed, uh, fresh feed delivery in the morning and fresh feed delivery in the afternoon. So we knew that they were eating significantly less during those peak feeding times. We also know, because of the previous work that we do, have done, that that's also the time that we also see a lot of competition. So Julie because we had the video, actually went and she looked at the social behavior. And what we monitored was displacements at the feed bunk. So every time a cow approached a cow, physical, physically hit the cow so that she was forced to leave the feed bin and the second cow that the uh, actor, she came in and took her place, we monitored that. And we looked at the difference between actors and reactors. And then we classified them as either um, subordinate or dominant, but looked at them according to healthy, uh, mild metritis and severely metritic cows. And what we showed was that the time, number of times a cow displaced another, so she instigated the event, healthy cows tended to displace other cows more often. So. The big question we have here is cause and effect, and unfortunately I can't tell you the answer to that yet, but what we are, the question that we're left with now, are these cows acting like subordinates, the cows that get really sick, because they're already feeling ill, and just general, you know, don't want to engage, or are they just by nature subordinate? So. We've got an experiment ongoing right now where we're actually trying to tease that out. 
but it'll hopefully in the next year or so we'll have a little bit more insight into that. What we do know, and again I don't think anybody's surprised, is that sick cows produce less milk. So this is daily milk production kilos um, from for the first three weeks. And what we saw was that those healthy cows produced 8 to 10 kilos more milk than their sick counterparts. What's interesting here is that we didn't have a difference in milk production between cows that were mildly metritic and severely metritic. What we know um, is that a lot of cows that are diagnosed with mild metritis are not treated. Um, just the, because of the challenges with milk withdrawal, but even though that they looked differently from the feeding behavior, their production response was no different than those cows that were severely metritic. So that was the end of Julie's master's project. I had another Julie who came, Julie Whitrock, who was an undergraduate who was really keen to do a summer project with me. And what we were interested in is looking at the long-term effects of metritis on milk production and also to look at, a, look at that in terms of repro and culling. So Julie did this experiment, um, she, we published that in 2007, and what Ju uh, Julie Whitrock then did was followed, took the cows from Julie's experiment, and then she added them for, for to cows that we had been following in subsequent experiments in order to cre increase the numbers. So what Julie Whitrock showed very clearly is that cows that are come down with metritis, um, that they never re well, they do recover, but it takes them about 20 weeks. And in this case, what we did is she only looked at cows that um, were severely metritic and compared those to healthy cows. And, which, and we know that the severely metritic cows are all uh, treated. So what you can see here is that it takes about 20 weeks for the lines to come together. We've got about a 10 kilo difference in the first three to, I would say, nearly eight weeks, and then about a five kilo difference. That is a tremendous amount of milk loss. So when we showed this data to our farm manager, he was not happy. <laughs> what Julie then also did is she looked to see what was the outcome for those cows that got sick, and for, this, the, for both the healthy and the metritis cows. And what she showed is that cows with metritis are much more likely to be culled than those cows that stay healthy. She then went and looked at those cows to see what were the primary reason for culling. And what she showed was that cows that were metritis were that came to, had metritis at some time on in early lactation were likely culled because they produced less milk, but also because they were not pregnant. And I don't think it's a surprise to any, any, any cow that has severe metritis, that's one of the known challenges of that, is trying to get her pregnant again. So that was an infectious disease. What we also have looked at is a metabolic disease, um, completely different etiology. Um, so we looked at uh, subclinical ketosis. Christy Goldhawk did a master's with us in this, and she followed healthy cows, um, well, transition cows, and then she diagnosed cows as having either um, being healthy, and again, no other sign of disease, and those that had subclinical ketosis. Subclinical ketosis was um, uh, determined by a blood sample in the week one or week, week two postpartum. All cows were diagnosed as healthy prepartum. And so what you see here, again, is this is dry matter intake kilos per day, and Christy summarized it by week. So two weeks before calving, one week before calving, and then to three weeks postpartum. We saw exactly the same thing here, in that these cows, um, already a week before calving, were starting to fall off on intake. And I think for those that um, you know, have done any work in subclinical ketosis, you know, as soon as dry matter get, intake goes down, they start to mobilize um, more fat, and you know, here is a challenge for these cows. But what was really interesting is what Christy did, is she also looked at the, uh, at the um, social behavior, and we saw exactly the same thing, is that those cows, um, not only ate less, but they were less able to displace others at the feed bunk before calving. So they were acting more like subordinates. So 
We're continuing to work in this area. Uh, we've got, I've got a student looking at um, mastitis now, and we're trying to understand, you know, what is it about these subordinate cows that, that puts them at risk? Do you remember I told you that I was going to try and convince you that lameness is a transition cow disease? <laughs> well, this is the data that I hope um, will convince you that it is. So Katie Proudfoot is a student. Um, she did a master's with me. She's actually now just finishing a PhD. And for her master's work, we were interested in looking at lameness and some of the causes of lameness. We know from um, work with and discussions in the literature that the highest incidence of claw horn lesions occurs 13 to 15 weeks after calving. And hoof anatomists tell us that it sort of takes 8 to 10 weeks for those, 8 to 15 weeks for those injuries to grow out. So if you go back in time to 8 to 15 weeks, where do you end up? you end up at transition. And so what Katie did is she looked at um, standing behavior during the transition period and she also then recorded the claw horn lesions and we then retrospectively again assigned cows to treatment to either healthy cows or cows that had either a severe hemorrhage or a, or a hoof uh, ulcer. And we looked at their behavior. This was a big stretch because we're talking, you know, 15 weeks in between cause and effect. So this is the standing behavior, so the standing time, minutes per day, of the cows that stayed healthy essentially through their entire lactation, all the way up to 15 weeks at least, with um, no evidence of any hoof health problems or anything like that. And so what we see, and we'd shown this in transition cows before, there's not a lot of change in, in the amount of time spent standing. She summarized the data here in week, uh, two weeks before. She separated out the 24 hours after calving, because again what we did is we knew exactly the moment that the cow calved and then corrected the data right around calving for the birth of the calf, and then week one and week two relative to calving. So those are the healthy cows. These are the cows that 15 weeks later had come down with some sort of hoof uh, sole hemorrhage or an ulcer. And what you see is that those cows that came down with that uh, hoof pathology were standing more to the tune of about 120 minutes longer in the two weeks before calving. But of course, I mean, Katie showed me this data and she was super excited about this and I said, but Katie, where are they standing? What are they doing? So luckily again, video and um, so she went back and she looked at where they were standing in that time in the, week in the weeks before calving. And she parsed it out and she, we looked at the pen and we were interested in how much time they were standing in front of the feeder, in the alley right behind the feeder. Um, we have in us in our facility we have a row of stalls and then an, uh, an alley at the back. So in terms of feeding time between these two groups, there was no difference. There was also no difference in amount of time spent in the feed alley. So the alley right behind, right um, in front of the feed bunk. No difference in the time spent in the back alley. We also looked then at stall usage. How were they using the stall for standing behavior? No difference in the amount of time four feet in the stall. And this doesn't surprise us there because in our facility the neck rail at that time was placed in such a way that the cows couldn't stand or the majority of the cows couldn't stand four feet in the stall. It's really only the small cows that could. So our management procedure was such that we were preventing them from doing this behavior. But we saw a huge increase in the amount of time standing with two feet in the stall in these weeks before calving. And these cows, 15 weeks later, had came down with some sort of lesion. So again, is it the behavior that drives the lesion? Um, so is it because these cows do this and that we're increasing the incidence uh, of the, the likelihood that they're going to come down with one of these pathologies? Or is it that they're already hurt and they're trying to find a dry place to stand? And for the longest time, we had absolutely no insights into that. 
Katie did look at social behavior and these cows were subjected to a lot of of displacements at the feed bunk and we know from other mammalian literature that you know a female that is going into approaching parturition we see a lot of hormonal changes the relaxin um, she's actually you know she needs the muscles and ligaments need to relax in order to have the baby so it could very well be so these cows are are through all this aggressive behavior at the feed bunk, it could be that they're just um, being subjected to jostling and therefore these injuries are occurring and then, as I said, it takes uh, 13 to 15 weeks for us to see them. So <clears throat> I want to shift gears now a little bit and just talk a little bit about some of the management work that we've done on transition cows and just a uh, study on cow regroupings, a little bit on feeding behavior and then some of the work that we've done on standing behavior. So, if you recall from the introduction that I gave that, you know, transition cows go through a, you know, five, six regroupings starting from the time that they're dried off from their previous lactation all the way through to the time that they reach the high group. So we did an experiment where we looked at um, keeping cows in a stable group. We knew what their social behavior was like in that stable group, and then we took um, one of those cows, one at a time, and we dropped them into another pen where, with unfamiliar cows. And in this case here, what I'm showing you is the displacement work, where, or the displacement data, where we differentiated between the reactor, so was she the cow that was bullied out, or did she, was she the actor? And what you can see is in the day before regrouping, when she's in her stable group, that we have um, about 10 events of each. But the day of regrouping, she still jostles or bullies um, about 10 other cows out through the course of the day, but look at the dramatic increase in the number of times that she is pushed out or displaced by other cows in the group. So about two and a half times. And what you see is it takes about three additional days for that behavior to stabilize again. We also know that cows lay down less when they're regrouped and so you can see here this is their lying time the day before calving and then the day of calving. We also know from, from this data that cows also spend less time eating in the days after regrouping and not surprisingly then they produced about four kilos less milk per day. So we know that she's subjected to these, this management procedure and so one of the things and we've noticed that this milk response so we've also looked at this whole issue of feeding management around the transition period. This is some more work done by Katie Proudfoot and she followed groups of uh, transition cows starting three weeks before calving to three weeks after calving. She looked at keeping transition cows in a non-competitive and a competitive environment and starting uh, she started three weeks before calving, but again we have 14 days of clean data to uh, 21 days post calving. Is it working? Yeah. And what you can see here is that especially prepartum, these cows are struggling in that competitive environment. And I don't have the data here, but we also looked at the difference between multi-paris and primi-paris cows. Multi-paris cows coped better than the primi-paris cows. The Primi Paris cows struggled even more. And what we think there is that the older animals just, they are able to, or, and we showed that in the paper, that they're able to change their rate of feeding to a greater degree than the younger animals. What Katie showed is that displacement increased by 65% when transition cows are overstocked. We had shown this in other work in terms of feeding behavior a few years before this. Um, my other graduate student Trevor DeVries did that at that time where we looked at difference between 50 centimeters per cow and uh, uh, a meter, so effectively doubling the, the feeding space and we also in, the, in that experiment showed a 60% increase in displacements when we went to half the amount of uh, feed space. So it's hugely, um, and it's a very competitive environment and that's the, you know, a big recommendation is please, please don't overstock your transition cows. Ideally I'd like to see, them, is see, see it down at 85% um, and this is both for the feeding line and for the stalls. What Kitty also then looked at was overstocking at the feed bunk 
um, resulted in increased standing time. Um, basically what these cows were doing was waiting to gain access to the feed bunk. This is standing time hours per day and again she had um, looked, at the data, looked at the data two weeks before, one week after calving and two to three weeks after calving. And the effects were greater, greatest around in the week after calving. Okay, overstocking. Um, at the stalls. So I've talked a little bit about the feed uh, bunk and now I just want to switch to the stalls. And the reason that when, that stalls um, where we don't want to overstock and for any of the primary resources is that we can't forget that these are herd animals. And the data that Katie showed as well as this data really shows us that cows like to do these, engage in these primary behaviors as a herd. In this case, um, Jose Freganose was a visiting scientist from Brazil. We did an experiment where we looked at the number of stalls per group of 12 cows and they had ac access to 8 stalls, 9 stalls, 10 stalls, 11 stalls and 12 stalls. The top graph shows lying time in the stall and the bottom one is waiting time outside the stall, waiting to gain access. So what you see here is that as we increase the number of stalls, not surprising, we saw a nice response in lying time and we saw a nice decrease in the amount of time spent standing outside of the stall. When you look at so, so what this also shows when you look at the pattern of these uh, lying behavior is that the pattern is exactly the same. So again, when one of the things that I often talk to producers about is the fact that we, when we hear the word cow comfort, we automatically think and um, be about the stall. Cow comfort is about more than the stall. It's about the stall, but it's also about the feeding area and it's about the standing area. So in terms of this standing area, um, one of the things that we know is that lameness is a challenge and here we did an experiment where we actually manipulated the neck rail. And what we wanted to do was to look at how the cows used the stall for standing. And this experiment came about because we'd done some work um, where we showed that lameness decreased on pasture and we were interested in how could we learn from that experiment and manipulate the intensive housing environment to allow her to express what we think a behavior that she's highly motivated to do, which is gain access to a dry, comfortable place to stand. We've done other work on neck rail placement and the placement of the neck rail really doesn't impact lying behavior very much. What it does is it changes how she uses the stall for standing, either two foot or four foot, and that depends on our, our decision to where we place the neck rail. Here you can see the neck rail was, we had the experiment was neck rail placement at 130 centimeters from the curb, so very aggressive, and we compared that to pushing the neck rail as far forward as we can, in this case was 190 centimeters. And we just, for ease of um, description, we've just called that no neck rail. We actually couldn't take the neck rail away because we lost stability, uh, the stability of the loops was compromised when we took the neck rail away completely. So in terms of how she used that, um, this stall for standing, what you can see is that in the neck rail treatment, so that uh, the treatment where the neck rail was very aggressive, we see lots of that two foot standing. So the same behavior that Katie had shown in another experiment for those cows that were eventually at risk for claw horn lesions, and hardly any four foot standing. Again, not surprising because we had managed this treatment so that she couldn't do this. Um, a big determinant determinant of whether or not they can four foot stand in the environment is cow size. So this was the neck rail treatment and we look at then those cows that had no neck rail or the 190 centimeters and what you can see is that we significantly reduced the amount of two foot standing and significantly increased the amount of four foot standing. Obviously with this behavior comes uh, a bigger challenge for the producer in terms of uh, cleaning the stall because they're more likely to defecate. But Clearly there was something about this that these cows were wanting to do. Part of this experiment is in terms of the neck rail placement is we had 
uh, assigned cows to the treatments based on locomotion scoring. So the average locomotion score in each of these groups was three. And we use a system one to five, with uh, basically one and two being healthy, three being clinically lame, and fours and fives severely lame. In this case, the average in the group uh, was three, so that meant that some cows were two and a half, some three, some three and a half. We had the odd four for ethical reasons, we didn't have the fives. So what we did was a crossover design, so cows were exposed to the one treatment for uh, five weeks, and at the end of the fifth week, we switched treatments. So what you can see here, this is the live gait score, and as by design, the average was a gait score of three, and the cows that had the neck rail got worse, and the cows that didn't have the neck rail got better in terms of their locomotion scoring. And what you can see at the end of the fifth week when we switched the treatments, lo and behold, those cows that had gotten better got worse again, and those that had the neck rail that now went to the no neck rail treatment got better. So, or we, at least we saw improvements. So one of the things that we really, the take home message for us from this experiment is that we really need to think about how we design these environments for transition cows and, and all cows for that matter in terms of the standing area. The time budget the, for intensively housed cows is, you know, on average they lay down sort of 9 to 11 hours a day, they eat for 3 to 5 hours a day, they go to the milk parlor and they stand on the concrete, or at least they're standing, for about 6 to 7 hours a day. We build barns with the idea that they milk, they feed, and they lie down. The challenge that we have is that nobody ever told the cow this. And despite all we do to make it comfortable environments, we cannot increase, um, we can't, she doesn't have enough, uh, any flexibility in her behavioral time budget to lay down an extra six to seven hours a day. And in fact, when we take cows and we put them out on pasture, they actually lay down less. So we only see on average about a nine hour lying down. So what I would like you to leave with is, um, rather than take home messages, I've got a few take home questions for you. So first of all, how much feed bunk space does each of your transition cows have? Secondly is, how many regroupings does your transition cow experience? And is there anything that you can do to minimize that? Um, one of the, the, the newest work that we've got, and I've just been reading the thesis, is um, one of the things to do is not regroup at the time of fresh feed delivery. So if you feed morning and night, maybe regroup at noon. Because I think then the cows need to explore their environments and they're not having to fight over feed at the same time. And lastly, does each transition cow have access to a usable stall and a dry, comfortable place to stand? And this is a barn that uh, one of my students was in, which is hopefully well, there's not too many barns like this. But that this idea of providing her a dry place to stand is something that, you know, I as a scientist am really trying to push and do research to how do we design these environments so that she can not only lie down in a comfortable place, but also stand in a dry, comfortable place. I'd just like to close with a thank you to the funders for all of this research. The, in addition to the federal government, our biggest contributor is the Dairy Farmers of Canada, and then we have a lot of other primary animal industries who support the work. Um, but a big hats off to our dairy farmers because they're the ones that about 15 years ago decided that they really needed to start supporting sort of this more grassroots uh, type of research. Thank you. So, I, and we did that experiment in our feed intake barn, so we had either one or two uh, cows assigned to a bin. Um, they all had stalls available to them, so they were not overstocked at the stall level. The biggest difference that we saw was in the displacement behavior, but we, it was no greater than what we had seen in another experiment, as I explained, in terms of looking at 50 centimeters 
uh, versus one meter, which was done in a headlock behavior, uh, headlock situation. So, you know, it is, yes, it was highly competitive, but the take home message from all the research that we've done and my colleagues, Nigel Cook um, in Wisconsin, who's done a lot of work on transition cows as well, we're both in complete agreement that the ideal environment is at about 85% stocking. Um, with you know at least 76 to 80 centimeters per cow uh, at the feed bunk. What we looked at um, is we we measured all of that, and we did um, in the analysis we actually looked to see whether or not calf birth weight. Um, dystocia rates, all those things um, contributed to the um, metritis. Clearly, if she has dystocia, she's much more likely to get an RP and therefore much more likely to get metritis. So dystocia had an effect, but when the primary um, indicator that always came out on top was either feeding time or feed intake. Uh, but because those two are highly correlated, we only looked at uh, dry matter intake. So, and everything else like days and the prepartum pen, all of that we looked at. But again, just to reiterate, the biggest thing was the, the change in uh, dry matter intake. Um, Nina, um, you said that some of the cows that stood two feet in um, had risk of lesions. Um, did they continue to do that behavior post calving as well? Um, great question, and we didn't actually look at that um, because the video analysis, Katie had so many cows in that experiment, and at some point she needed to finish her master's. <laughs> so we just looked at it um, in the period that, um, in the weeks before calving. My prediction is that at least in the first week after calving that they definitely had that. I really do think, and, and I charge anybody that can do this, this experiment, is to look at the, num the amount of displacement and whether or not there is sort of when they're hit so hard that they're, um, there's twisting of the hoof. And I think those injuries are what's contributing to the lesion. And I, my prediction is that she's already feeling pain and she's trying to find a dry place to, to stand. Okay, excellent, Nina. Excellent, Nina. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer those questions. Um, we're going to run out of time now, um, so I would just like to thank you so much for your time. Also, just to reiterate that this presentation will be available um, online. Um, um, via our website within the next um, um, few days. For those of you that requested a um, copy of slides, I'm sure Nina would be delighted to, to leave us a copy of her, her, her slides. Um, so anyone who has requested, I will make sure you receive a copy via email. Just make sure that you've sent in your email address when, you, when you've asked a question. Um, and also, anybody that has questions that they want to ask me directly, I, my email is on the first uh, slide, so please don't hesitate to email me. Absolutely, if I don't respond right away, please bug me. Because <laughs> so, I do try to, I always try to respond to every email, but sometimes it takes me a little, a few days to get there. So the um, the presentation from this afternoon, which was improving cow comfort on the farm, um, will also be available on our website, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, and I would just like to thank you all very much for logging in and uh, for, for listening um, to us, and also to draw your attention to a Dairy Co. Research Day that we're going to be running on the 27th of March at the University of Reading's Dairy Research Farm. You can get more information from our website on www.dairyco.org.uk underneath the event section. Also you'll notice underneath the event section there's a section um, listing the webinars that we are currently running. Um, so please keep posted and we'll look forward to having you all tune in again soon. Thanks very much and good night.